Think about your favorite band. Odds are your favorite song isn't the first one you heard. It's something you discovered after living with that band and listening to their music for a while. I think it's the same with authors. Most of my favorite authors, I find that my favorite pieces by them aren't their greatest hits. And so what I'm going to do today is dig into these authors and share some of the deep cuts, the things that I wound up loving more than I loved their bestsellers. I'm going to start by talking about Chekhov. I started reading Chekhov because people said you have to read his short stories as just examples of the form. And one of the ones people talk about is The Lady with the Little Dog. Now, I read this short story twice, not because I liked it, but because the first time I read it, I was convinced that maybe I didn't get it. Like, there seemed to be something missing, some illusion or some twist that I had just been reading too fast to catch. So I went back, I read the story again, and then I went online, I did some research, and I got it. There's just not that much there. It's a slice of life story. But one of the benefits of reading short stories is, hey, if you don't like that one, turn the page. There's another one waiting. And after living with Chekhov for a while, I found the story called The Little Joke. It's about a couple that goes sledding on this cold, blustery winter's day. And as they're going down the hill, the man tells the woman, whispers in her ear, I love you. But when they get to the bottom of the hill, he tells her that he didn't say those words, and she's left with this mystery where she wonders, like, was this my boyfriend speaking to me? Was it the world speaking to me? Was it the winter? Was it the wind? And that sense of possibility suddenly infuses this story with this almost magical quality. It had that twist, that nuance of both the characters and what they might be thinking throughout the story that I missed with some of the more traditional Chekhov stories, and I thought it was just great. It's also super short. It's only five or six pages long. So if you wanted to get into Chekhov, that would be a really good place to start. Next, David Foster Wallace. If you read David Foster Wallace, everybody tells you read Infinite Chest. This is the big work. It is the work that he was famous for before his life was tragically cut short. And it's a great book. One of my favorites. It's amazing to get through. It's also 1,200 pages long, and those are not easy to read pages. They're super dense. There's lots of footnotes. And a short story that I love almost as much as I love Infinite Jest is found in this collection, The Oblivion Stories. It's called The Soul is a Smithy, and it's about a classroom one day where the teacher suddenly goes insane, and he starts writing, kill them all, kill them all, on the blackboard. Most of the kids, being smart, run for it, but there's a few that stay behind because maybe they're just outcasts and they just don't understand what is happening in their classroom. And it's about the experiences of one of those kids. Now, I don't want to give away this story or the gut punch moment that happens at the end of it, but there's a suggestion that maybe the teacher's actions were misinterpreted that absolutely sent chills up my spine when I read this story. It's sending chills up my spine right now even just thinking about it. So if you wanted to get into David Foster Wallace, don't want to jump into a 1,200-page truck of a book like Infinite Jest, Souls of Smithy in this collection is a deep cut that really gives you an idea of what made him so special and why we miss him so much. Next, let's talk about Flannery O'Connor. Now, I am a Flannery O'Connor completist. I have read everything that she's written, all the fiction she's ever written. And like everybody else, the first thing I read is A Good Man is Hard to Find. This is one of those stories that they teach you in high school. It's about a family, they're going on a road trip, they run into convicts, bad things happen. It has a moment of grace at the end, which is what O'Connor was really known for. These places where people find grace in these difficult situations. But as I read more and more Flannery O'Connor, she didn't write that much stuff, so it was easy for me to sit down and say, you know what, I'm just going to read it all. I'm going to read everything she's ever written. And I started to develop this picture of her in my mind. I don't know how accurate it is, because I'm not an O'Connor scholar. I haven't read biographies of her. But I felt this tension in her work, where part of her felt, you know, I have the talent to go to Paris with the Lost Generation. And I have the talent to go sit at the Algonquin Round Table with Dorothy Parker or whatever it is. And yet, she had very bad health. She was very connected to her Southern roots. She was a Catholic writer. And all of those things pulled her in a different direction, in this very formal sort of mode of writing. This mode of writing where she was really imparting lessons and morals throughout everything that she did. The deep cut that I fell most in love with was actually an essay in this book, Mystery and Manners. Now, this is a nonfiction book, and 
the very first essay, she writes about her experiences raising peacocks. So something she did at her farm, it's a thing that gives her life meaning. And in that sort of tension, that idea of the peacock, both as a symbol of something that's really grand, but also something that at the end of the day is just a bird, I found a connection to Flannery O'Connor that maybe I didn't find anywhere else in her fiction. And last, because like every video on this channel, I tend to mention Thomas Pynchon a lot. You read Thomas Pynchon. I did a separate video that talked about where to start with Thomas Pynchon. If you're really looking into Pynchon, that's probably a better place to go. But my own personal favorite or the deep cut that I always don't understand why people don't like is Vineland. This is a story about a young girl trying to figure out why the cops and the system is always after her lovable hippie dad. He doesn't seem like that bad a guy. And she goes back to discover the roots of her parents' relationship, the roots of the conflict between her mother and her father, and how they get tied into the conflict between the counterculture and the capitalist culture, the system that runs America. To me, this book, because it is a little bit easier to understand than something like Gravity's Rainbow, is sometimes a little bit better way to get into pension. You can really start to think about how beautiful the stories are and really get to understand the characters. And instead of like all these themes and all these absurd things where every single sentence leads you down a different rabbit hole, in Vineland, there's only one rabbit hole. And you are traveling down it with this girl as she tries to understand exactly what makes relationships, both in the public sphere and between people who even love each other, so difficult. So this is a pension deep cut, if you can have a deep cut of someone who only wrote eight books so far, that I absolutely adore. And if you're getting into pension, it's a good one to go to. So there you have it, four deep cuts, four alternate rabbit holes to go down if you wanted to get any of the authors that I talked about.